Lift up the word and repeat after me. I believe this is the word of God. I believe what God says because it is impossible for God to lie. In these last days, and make no mistake about it, we are in the last days. The Bible tells us that many, many things are going to take place. The church is a glorious church. The church has the glory of the Lord living inside of us. We are the church. Jesus is coming back for the glorious church. In Luke 18, 8, he said, he said, when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? The answer is yes, he will. Where will he find that faith? In the glorious church. That's us. And so, fear not when it comes to the end of days. You will hear of wars and rumors of wars in diverse places, but nothing shall harm you. You have been called. You have been set aside. The wrath of God, which is going to come on this earth, is not for the church. Jesus doesn't beat up his bride just before he marries her. Jesus, now listen, Jesus is not a wife beater. Okay? But there's going to be some things happen in these last days, and we need to know about these things. So the scripture tells us in John 16, 13, however, when, let's just all read this together. However, when He, the Spirit of truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. For He will not speak on His own authority, but whatever He hears, He will speak, and He will tell you things to come. So the Holy Spirit is going to teach us from the inside out He's, he's going to teach us about things that are going to happen in this time to come. Well, this time to come is here. The, the time that has been prophesied, it's here. We are the church. We are in the last days. This is the last generation. And if you don't believe that, if, regardless, it's your last generation. And we need to understand that Matthew 24, 11, Jesus is telling about something that's going to happen during the tribulation. And he says, many, what? False prophets will rise up and deceive some people. No, they will deceive many. Now what we are seeing right now is we are so close to the return of Jesus that we are seeing some things that are going to happen after the return of Jesus here on this earth during the Great Tribulation. We are seeing the, the, what we would call the precursor to it. We're seeing a, a little bit of preview. We're seeing the buildup. See, there was a time in Europe when certain politicians went to Germany before World War II, and they proclaimed that there was going to be peace because they had signed a contract with the devil, I mean Hitler. <laughs> However, all the time that the peace treaty was being drawn up and signed, Hitler was building up his war machine in the background he, he was doing what it was he was preparing to do. He was preparing for the big takeover. But the people who went back to England, the gentleman, the politician who went back to England and waved that document around, that peace document signed by Hitler, he waved it around and he says, we're going to have peace in our generation. Well, here's the deal. The devil's always going to be the devil. You're, you're not going to change the devil. The devil's always going to come, as it says in John 10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. The devil, listen, the devil is always going to be the devil. You're not going to get the devil saved. 
But likewise, there's always going to be people like that politician in England who was deceived. And he came back and deceived many more because of his deception. Now, let's take a look at 1 Timothy 4.1. 1 Timothy 4.1. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith. Now, think about this. You can't depart from something had, had you not been there. You know, you can come over to my house and depart, but you can't depart from my house until you get to my house. So there's going to be people who are in the faith, who are going to depart from the faith. And this is why a, a few weeks ago I gave you the message on continuing, abiding, don't give up. If you quit, you can't win. So there's something about continuing. The enemy will always try to get you to quit. He'll try to get you to get outside the faith. I mean, just, just watch one of the, the lions or tigers or whatever it is over in Africa, and they chase a herd, and which one do they get? They get the one in the herd that decides, hey, I know a quicker route. <laughs> I know a better way. And that one animal gets away from the herd, and that's the one that the enemy zeroes in on. Don't let the enemy zero in on you. you know, somebody say, well, what's, so what about gathering together at church? And I realize there's many people, we have probably thousands today who are watching live right now, but maybe they can't even get to a church. We've got people in other countries that feel that this is their church because they're getting fed here. And I understand you can't take a, a 12-hour airline trip to, to get here for church today. I understand that. But the Bible says that in the last days, we should not forsake the gathering together of ourselves. Somebody says, well, are you just talking about a herd mentality? Yes, I am. Stay with the herd, okay? Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and didaskalos, that's, that's the Greek word for doctrine. Excuse me, I forgot what language I was speaking for a moment. Deceiving spirits and doctrines, didaskalos, of demons. What are deceiving spirits? What are the doctrines of demons? Now, the reason that Paul wrote this is because in this time, you need to be aware you need to be aware that there are doctrines, there are teachings that are demonic, that are anti-Christ. And here's what they do, verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. So the deception is going to try to deceive those who believe and know the truth. Are you a believer? Do you know the truth? Okay, well then, you're the target. You are who the false teachers are coming to get. And they want you to be led astray from sound doctrine that's in the Word of God into something flaky that seems right because it ministers to your flesh. Second Timothy 4.3 for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers. And they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. You know, the Scripture Okay, how many women in the church 
hypothetically, you're over 100. Okay, well, and you're married. Well, the Bible talks about old wives' tales. And that's as close as I'm going to get. Because I need to go home today after church. Not implying that Loretta is an old wife. And that's not even, she, I'm going to skip that page. Okay. <laughs> but the Bible does talk about old wives' tales. And Loretta and I, we were reading this scripture the other day, and she looked it up on the internet. And we were in the car, so I couldn't escape. Uh, but but she, she looked it up on her, on her iPad. And it, it basically means fables. It's just, a, it's a, just an old term that's been around for centuries. It, it just means fables that aren't true. Just made-up fables. Things that are so easy to convince people of. You know, uh, it's, it's been said, and it's true, that if you keep saying a lie over and over and over, people will eventually believe it, no matter how stupid it is. And then they'll make up false references to verify it, you know, for example, you can't go swimming for one hour after you eat or you'll get cramps. It's not true. Medically, it's not true. You can look it up. It's not true. But all my life growing up, when I was a little kid, we had church trips, and they wouldn't let us go into the pool for an hour after we ate because that's what, I mean, it's documented. Well... But in the church, you'd be amazed at how many sacred cows that are just old wives' tales. And people believe them. I mean, we have most of the body of Christ today. They're, they're saved, they're born again. But most of the body of Christ today, most believe that the gifts of the Holy Spirit passed away with the apostles. And that the gifts of the Holy Spirit, the miraculous power of the Holy Spirit is not available for us today. Well, how do you know that? Well, just ask Jim back there. When we were in Bible college, that's what we were taught, right? I mean, that, that's what the professor said. And after all, if the professor says it, it's got to be true. So you have people teaching false things, and they're teaching other people. And next thing you know, you have the whole church believing something. Ephesians 4.11, and he himself, this is Jesus, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect, and that Greek word there also means mature, mature man to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children. Okay, now here's the deal. In the same way that on earth many people teach their children fables, the tooth fairy, the Easter bunny, Santa Claus. Are you, are you following me? We should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men in cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. Now that's a mouthful right there. But here's, here's how we combat this. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head. Christ. Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, from whom the whole body joined and knit together. Now let me tell you something. We need to be joined and knit together. In these last days, do not forsake the gathering together of the body because there is strength when we lock arm in arm with each other and share the true faith, and if we are together, if we are together, and a false doctrine 
or a silly or goofy teaching starts springing up, we can speak the truth with love and correct. Not condemn, but correct. And sadly, some people won't receive correction. And when they won't, well, I'm out of here. And they have itching ears, as the Scripture says, and they'll go someplace that'll scratch their ears. From whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying, the building up of itself, the body, in love. Now that's a big deal. I said that's a big deal. Now, let's just take a look at another scripture. See, you can't go wrong with scripture. See, I could have said all that to you, and you would have, well, yeah. But when I, when I show you the scripture, see, it, you, can't, you can't deny the scripture. 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. <clears throat> For such are false prophets, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. You're going to have people that are going to come to you, and they may have all kinds of credentials and, and degrees or whatever, and they may come to you with all kinds of recommendations, but they may not be who they say they are. That's where being led of the Spirit, operating in the gifts of the Spirit, and using the wisdom that God has given you that you have asked for, like it says in the book of James, you can discern the Spirit. Because it's just amazing to me how over the years I have had so many people come to me and prophesy something that was just either insane, stupid, goofy, or wrong. Now, that doesn't mean that they were a goofball. Well, in a couple of cases they were. But, <clears throat> I mean, right after we started this church. You know, many of you don't know, and I'm going to share in a few weeks how all this developed, and how we got to where we are now. But right after we started this church, it started as a Bible study 29 years ago, and right after we started the church, we were, we were meeting over at uh, Main Street Music Hall. We had our Sunday services there. And we had four or five stores rented that we used for children's church, bookstore offices, and that type of thing. And twice, one time we had a lady come, and she looked very prophetic. You know, it's interesting how sometimes prophets want to look prophetic. And they just end up looking pathetic. <laughs> sometimes. Sometimes. You don't judge people by the way they dress. Some people say, well, John the Baptist was weird. He ate locusts. Well, it w check it out in the actual Greek language. We're not talking about a bug. We're it's a part of a plant. Okay, well, never mind. See, you've just heard that he ate bugs for so long that everybody thinks John the Baptist went around eating bugs. It's a fable. Okay. So this lady came in and she said, and she met with me and, and uh, your dad, your dad was in this meeting, and uh, another person. And she came in and she brought me my outline for the next Sunday of what I was supposed to preach. And letting me know that from now on I would be submitting to her and that uh, we were a part of her ministry. She was the apostle and I was the pastor. And so I not only cast out the devil, I cast her out. Actually, she left on her own. When she found out I wasn't going to preach her sermons. I see, I get my sermons from the Holy Spirit. We had... Uh, Three men show up at our church about a year after that. Suits, ties. And they were from a large church in Kansas City. 
And they proceeded to tell me that God had spoken to them and that we were to give our church to them and submit to them. They never came back either. See, you're, you're going to, because I knew, see, God had spoken to me about what we're going to do. I knew what, I knew what was going to happen. And there were many prophetic things that took place that got us even to where we are here. We were meeting in a storefront and we had a gentleman come in that we had never seen before. And it was on a Thursday night Bible study. And during our praise and worship, which we just had one or two people playing a guitar and singing. You were there, Ryan, I believe. Yeah. And uh, he said to somebody, can I use the restroom? Well, this place that we were renting was previously a store, and it just had one bathroom back in the back. You had to go out to a little hallway, and down the hallway there's another bathroom. And we had been renting this place. We had it rented full time. And uh, so this guy went back to use the facilities, and, and he came out. And when he came out, he had a, he had a, a, a painting, a, a big painting of a church. I'd never seen this guy before in my life. And he came up and he told our church, <clears throat> we probably had 25 people there at the time, he told us, he said, this is your church, God's going to give it to you. Uh-huh. Okay. Never saw him again. That, and we, we had been in, in that bathroom like a bazillion times, and nobody had ever seen this picture back there. You know, and he didn't bring it with him because it was, it was a big picture, a painting, an oil painting, a precise oil painting. And we never saw him again. And then about a year or so later, when we moved into this building, we realized that that painting was this building. It was this building. Exactly. Every window, just exact. See, well, who was that? That may have been an angel unaware. Of course, when Robbie was little, he asked me one time, he said, well, he said, a church, he kept talking about the angel's underwear. What? I said, no, Robbie, no, no. It's angels unaware. <laughs> so, you know, you may, you may entertain angels unaware. <laughs> you never know what goes in the minds of these little kids. You know, I, I've shared this before. When I was little in, in the Baptist church, I always wanted to sing the song about the turtle. You know, I'd, I'd tell them, are we going to sing the turtle song today? Lead on, oh kinky turtle. It was King Eternal, but I, it's not the way I heard it. <laughs> hey, we're singing about the kinky turtle again. Cool. Lead on, oh kinky turtle. <laughs> you know, and as a kid, I was thinking, what's that got to do with church? I don't know, but it must be a special turtle. That's all I can figure. Okay, for such are false prophets, deceiving workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. Uh, the word for angels here is Angie, do you have a graphic of the word angels in Greek that you could put up on the screen? Uh, here we go. Uh, okay, now this, this is the Greek word for angels. It's alpha, gamma, gamma, epsilon, lambda, omicron, sigma. Okay? Now, the, the gamma is pronounced with a, a g sound, but anytime you have two gammas uh, together in Greek, it's pronounced with an ng sound. So if you transfer those letters like the alpha to an A, the gamma gamma to an NG, epsilon to an E, lambda to an L, etc., you, you get the word angels. 
So this is the Greek word that you see for angels. Some of your Bibles will use the word messenger. And that's because in the Greek, the same word for angel is the same word for messenger. And the reason for that is, is because that's what angels are. They're messengers sent from God. To, they're messengers. So this is kind of a, a play on words here, if we'll go back to that scripture. Therefore, it is no great thing if his angelos, his ministers, no, that's not ministers there, excuse me. Uh, his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness who will be according to their work. Okay, it's, um, yeah, where is it here? Ah, here we go. See, here's the thing. The Bible says, even if an angel comes to you yes. preaching a different gospel, yes. you don't receive it. Yes. Why not? Because all angels are not of God. One third of the angels, approximately, here on the earth, are satanic, demonic, speaking lies. And they can use people and transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. Even Satan himself can, it says, can transform him into, he looks like light, but he isn't. He just looks like. So you can't go by what things look like. You've got to go by what they are. Okay. I'm going to quickly run through the rest of my sermon now. Look, I will tell you this. I have a two-part session that's on YouTube. It's called Angels and Demons Explained. One's called Authority Over Demons. We go through a lot of this. But you need to understand, and what I'm wanting to come against today is the reality of what you hear these last days on television, in Bible studies, in churches. You check it out with the Word of God because there's a lot of junk going around. And there has been a lot of junk going around. And I'm old enough that I've seen this stuff go around a time or two. There's things that went around when I was in my 20s that went away and came back when I was in my 50s. And, and now that I'm in my 90s, they're back again, you know. <laughs> and, uh, well, I, I just saw something the other day. Here's something that's being encouraged by a Christian, by a Christian group who has some good teachings, they're into grave sucking. And here's the, what they're doing, and this is what they're teaching their people through a Bible study from this particular church. To go out to the graves of people who are known powerful Christians who have passed on, you know, like go out to Catherine Kuhlman's grave, go out to Billy Graham's grave, or uh, they even went out to Charles Finney's grave. <laughs> and lay on top of the grave so that the anointing, you can suck the grave and get the anointing from the departed hero in the faith. Where do they get this? Well, in, in 2 Kings chapter 13, there's this story about this guy that he was dead, and he gets thrown into a cave, and he lands on the prophet's bones, and he comes back to life. <clears throat> but there's no mention in the Scripture about that man receiving the anointing of Elisha. He came back to life. But see, they add to it. And there's no mention of the people of God making a ritual out of that event. And sometimes we can become like the people of Israel were when they were in the wilderness and they kept getting bit by snakes, poisonous snakes. And so they went to Moses and they said, hey, what, what can we do? What can we do here? So Moses went to God and he says, what do we do? How can we handle this? God says, here's what you do. You put a pole up and you put a bronze serpent up on the pole and this is where the doctors get their little insignia that we use today with a snake on a pole. He said, you put a 
a bronze serpent up on a pole, and you tell everybody, you tell all the Israelites, if you get bit by a snake, a, a fiery serpent, you go to that designated place in the camp, and you see that serpent lifted up on a pole, you'll be healed. Now here's the deal. 400 years later, there was a group of Israelites who were worshiping that post. They kept that post with that bronze serpent, and they, for 400 years they've been worshiping this snake on a post. They even gave the snake a name. They called him Nehushtan. And King Hezekiah, he said, you guys are weird. No, he didn't say it that way. But he said, this is, this is a false thing. See, it started out as a thing of God. It started out as something God said to do. Okay? But then they took it and added to it and started worshiping the thing instead of worshiping the Lord and started a false teaching, a false religion, and Hezekiah had to get that bronze serpent and just beat the tar out of it, break it up. <laughs> he got rid of it. <clears throat> well, don't do it. Don't, <clears throat> don't make a, a sacred cow out of something that happened. All right, quickly here. Acts 20, verse 19. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. In a church, and I thank God for this church, I love this church, and I don't necessarily see this happening in our church, but I'm just speaking the body of Christ as a whole. Do not allow a group to spring up from within the church. It says from within who gathers together themselves in such a way that they start pulling away and they start having diverse doctrines that are not in the church. And the Bible talks about, there, there were people in New Testament times that got drawn away, they started worshiping angels. They, they started getting into weird stuff. Angels are real. And they're here to minister for the saints. And you can talk to the Lord about them if you would like. But just don't get strange. You know, I, had a, I was out in the atrium one day and a guy told me he just flew into church. And I said, oh, to the airport next door? You know, he said, no, no, I just flew in. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I... I flew in. And I said, without an airplane? Oh, I don't need an airplane. He said, I circled the church three times because that's what I like to do. Circled the church three times. I saw the lighthouse and I just thought I'd come here. He wasn't kidding. But see, here's the deal. He took a scripture that Philip was caught away. And then an angel actually caught him. The word there with Philip is caught up. It's the same. It's uh, harpazo. It's, it's the same word that used you for being caught up at the rapture. It's the same word in the original language. And he took that that, hey, I can just get caught up anytime I want. And he did get caught up into a weird teaching. And he said he was going to fly back home. I went out and stood at the door up there and watched as he, the way he flew home is he walked up the hill. Okay. 2 Peter 1, 19 and 20. And so we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. Don't, don't try to come up with some private interpretation that just makes you look like you got something deeper that nobody else got. Some people 
are seeking after a revelation. Now, I'm, take, take this in context. That's wrong. You're not supposed to seek a revelation from God. You seek God, He gives you the revelation. He ministers the revelation to you that you need in the hour that you need it. And it will always parallel and come line up with the Word of God. And if you get some prophetic word, I have heard some pathetic, well, okay, I've heard some pathetic prophetic words. I've heard people, oh, well, okay, that's another story. Look, there, there was a lady a few years ago, bless her heart, but she tried to help Jesus out. And so at her meetings, feathers fell from the sky. Feathers fell from the sky. And uh, then a gentleman we know who is a pastor just happened to have digital cameras at his church and filmed her meeting, and she'd been traveling all over the country. She's getting famous. She'd show up at church and feathers fall out of her. Whoa. She'd pray for people and her feather would come down. Well, you know, you can do all kinds of little magical tricks if you know how. And that's what she was doing. She had a way of flinging the feathers and it was kind of like, how'd she do it? Well, you get a digital camera in slow motion and, and you kind of figure it out. And, and, and don't, don't get on to me about this, what I'm getting ready to say. Okay? But it's kind of like gold dust coming out of the sky. Well, that much gold dust is coming out of the sky. God's not cheap. I mean, he's going he's to be dropping some you know, 100 ounce bars. <laughs> then, you know, why, why, do we, why do we sweep the stuff up when the service is over and put it in the trash? Why, why don't we take it to the bank? Now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just saying some people try to help God, and it's been very well documented that there have been a few churches who, during a revival service, puts this uh, flaky makeup stuff. What do they call that? Glitter? Is it called glitter? Put it in the air conditioning vents. You know. I had a guy come up to me one time and says, man, look at this. Look at all this glitter. I said, man, you've just been hugging women that got a lot of glitter on, you know. I'm not against manifestations of the Holy Spirit. There are some very strange things that happen with the Holy Spirit. But don't, here's the thing. Some people try to help the Holy Spirit out. We don't need fake stuff. I want the real thing. You know, I, I've had, I've been in churches where they have smoke machines and smoke's rolling off the, the platform. You know, the pastor comes out and it's like Rocky Balboa coming out and all that kind of stuff. And, and they'll have strobe lights and everything. Well, you know, the Bible says that they're the Shekinah glory, as Loretta says, Shekinah glory. I've got to speak Hebrew when I'm around her. Okay, but the Shekinah glory came into the temple and and it was kind of like a, a smoke, and, and it was so strong that the priest couldn't stand up to minister. That's in the Bible. So can it be that you can be in a meeting, and the Shekinah glory, the, the visible manifested presence of God would flow into the room? And I believe it did happen at Azusa Street, and some of these things. It, it was, it's real. It's real. But I don't need a smoke machine to help God out. And my thought is, if I got the the whole church auditorium filled up with fake smoke, then when the real Holy Spirit shows up, people will get confused. We don't need to be helping out the, the Holy Spirit. He's perfectly capable of manifesting Himself. What we need to do is receive. And don't get critical if you see something you've never seen before. You know, it's kind of like uh, one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit is gifts of healings plural so within that one gift there's many different gifts and there's many different types of healings so don't just say well you know jesus you know he spit on the ground put that on their eyes and so i think if anybody's ever going to get healed we need to be the first church of the spitters you know can't get healed unless you spit oh, no no don't get goofy. He healed people other ways too. Okay. All right. Acts 20, 29. For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. As I just said to you, 
they will come in and sometimes from among you. Now, we don't need to be critical. All right? And people use the scripture, well, judge not. Well, we judge every day. You got to take that scripture in context. I mean, how can you discern if you don't say, this is right? What you're doing is you're judging this is right and this is wrong. You're, you're making a determination. When it says judge not, that's talking about having a critical spirit. You know, you can critique something I say without criticizing me. And a lot of times people just need to be nudged in the right direction. All right. Um, prophecy. 1 Corinthians 14.3 but he who prophesies speaks edification, exhortation, and comfort to men. If it brings grief or stress, it's not a prophecy from God. If it brings condemnation, it's not a prophecy from God. Hmm. Well, this, this applies to what James had to say earlier. Colossians 3.16, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. See, we can admonish each other. I, I'm not above correction. I have people correct me on a daily basis on the Internet. <laughs> but you know what? Every now and then somebody says something that's like, oh, I see what they mean. Maybe I, maybe I am saying that not exactly right. See, we should never be above correction. All right. False spirits will not confess Jesus as the Christ. 1 John 4, 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Well, another word for test is judge them. You know what I'm saying? So take the word judge in its proper context. You're not supposed to judge somebody else's salvation. That's between them and God. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you will know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is of God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is already in the world. Now let me tell you something. Most religions believe that Jesus Christ came to the earth as a man. But they don't believe that the Son of God came in the flesh. Muslims believe, Muslims believe that Jesus Christ was a great prophet. They teach it. It's in the Koran. Jesus was a prophet. Mormons teach that Jesus was an angel. No. Jesus wasn't an angel, is not an angel, never has been an angel. So, here's, here's the thing. Jesus Christ is the Son of God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, who were here at the beginning. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, Verse 14 says, and the Word became flesh. He was here in the beginning as a part of the Godhead. He came as the Son of Man, put aside His Son of Godship, and lived 33 years on the earth as a man, died as a man. God resurrected Him. He did not resurrect Himself. God resurrected Him. Almighty God resurrected Him. And then He took His place with a resurrected, glorified body at the right hand of the Father as the Son of God to rule and reign perpetually for all eternity. And we who believe in Him are His body, the, His bride, and that's the truth. And any variation of that is wrong. Now, does somebody who believes some of that stuff not saved? No, look, to get saved, and I got a big criticism on this just a few weeks ago. A guy wrote me a letter so long that I didn't read it all. I think I'd still be reading. if. I... But he said, you're making salvation too simple. No, I'm making salvation what the Bible says. 
It says, if you believe in your heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, you believe that God raised Him from the dead, and He is your Lord, you make Him Lord, and you confess it, you're saved. And you may believe a thousand goofy things, but if the goofy things don't get you unsaved, what gets you saved is believing the truth. Okay? And so what we need to do is, as a church, be able to recognize the goofy things without getting goofy ourselves. All right. Oh, my goodness. James, you shouldn't have talked so long. Okay. <laughs> I'm, just, I'm just teasing you. You know that, don't you? All right. Uh, prophecies. You ask yourself, does it produce liberty or bondage? Does it minister to your spirit or does it minister to your flesh? Sometimes good people just get goofy. I've been goofy. I mean, we had Bible study in our house one time, and, you know, they're trying to cast the demon out of our well and out of the doorknob and the fireplace. And I didn't rebuke them because I just figured, well, if that's what they're doing, they must know. They must be there. That was back in the day. Well, see, but I'm smarter now. Because we grow. We start out as babes in Christ, and we don't know a whole lot. We get saved, and, and we grow, and, and we mature. Hmm. And sometimes growing produces silliness just because of immaturity. Hmm. So what do you do? Philippians 3.17, Paul says this, Brethren, join in following my example, and note those who walk. And it gives you a pattern. Now, here's what you've got to ask yourself. Would you be able to go to a new Christian and say, okay, here's the way you live a godly life. Just watch me. You do what I, just watch me. If you see me at the grocery store, you see me driving down the highway, you see me at church, see me talking, interacting with my family. You do everything the way I do it. Well, according to Paul, this is what we're, we're supposed to, as we mature, we should become a part of the pattern of godliness so that people can... You should be able to say to your children, hey, you can do as I say, and you can do as I do. You know, not, none of this, well, don't do as I do, do what I say. No, no, you can do, you can say what I say, and you can do what I do. Because I'm... To the best of my ability, I'm living a godly life. And if I mess up, I'm going to tell you about it so you won't mess up in the same place. Wow. Have you noticed, Jim, how, how quiet it got back there? There's all those little th levers on the soundboard. They're not moving, are they? It's real quiet in here. There's a kind of hush. Come over the church tonight. Okay. Hmm. Here's what false prophets will try to do. They will try to deceive you. And here's something you need to remember. People who are deceived do not think they are deceived. That's the definition of the word deception. So when, when you try to correct something in love to someone who is deceived, do not be surprised if they don't just swell up and because they don't, they don't believe they're deceived. And so how do you get somebody who is either sitting under a goofy teaching or actually a good Christian who is teaching a goofy, goofy thing, how do you get them set free? By teaching the truth in love and being an example. All right. Hmm. Is the prophecy, is what's being taught soaked in love? You know, here's something else that Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, 2. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I can remove mountains, but have not love, I'm nothing. 
zero, zip, nada. All right, now I'm just down to a few closing notes. You'll see here, there's, there's no scriptures on it. You're not supposed to clap at that. Come on. <laughs> I'm over here, I'm sitting down to my closing notes, and Bill's back there going. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks a lot, Bill. You know. <laughs> uh, I love you, Bill. Yeah. <laughs> All right. How do we live during this time of deception? And we're living in a time of great deception. There are very famous people that are doing some very strange things. How do we do it? Now, there, hey, now that's something else too. Just because a ministry is big, don't get, don't get mad at them. You know, I, the other day I, I kind of I looked up false teachers on the internet. I'd just been waiting for my name to show up there. Uh, and... I, I made the top 100 a couple years ago, but I guess they feel I'm getting normal again. I don't know. But it was amazing to me how many of what they call the, the top 10 false teachers were huge ministries that are getting millions of people saved. And most of it is... Um, it's just fables so how, how do we deal with all of this stuff well the lord gave me in the night he gave me this solution number one walk in love number two teach the truth number three don't get caught up in arguments don't be that person on Facebook or Twitter who is just answering every single theological question out there. Just You speak the truth and don't get into arguments. You're not going to change anybody in an argument on Facebook. Don't criticize. Whatever you do, don't criticize another ministry. Don't gossip. And don't, when you gossip, you're being led astray by the devil. Don't. Here's how you destroy the lie with the truth. Now, sometimes you need to stand up for people. You know, like I did with this gentleman. You need, to, you need to kind of just stop it. And it always gets me. People come up and they say, you know, Pastor, I shouldn't be telling you this. And I say, well, then don't. But you need to know. No, I don't. If you, you, don't, you, you know you're not supposed to be telling me this, well, then don't tell me this. But i got to tell somebody. See, sometimes people will give you a prayer request just so they can find out stuff. Okay. You better be led and make sure 100% that it's the Holy Spirit telling you to rebuke somebody and not jealousy or resentment. I, I see this all the time. People get resentful for ministries that have success. And big ministries get hit the biggest. Here's what you need to do. Keep your own house clean. Put your hand on your chest. Say, I will keep my own house clean. I'll quit peeking through the windows of other people's houses and being critical about their mess. My responsibility is to keep my house clean. Okay. You're not responsible for what someone else teaches unless it comes into your house. When strange teachings start coming into this house, and it's happened over the years, and, and sometimes by good people, it's, it's not, but we correct with love. Sometimes it's a minor thing, sometimes it's a major thing, you know. Uh, and the worship team is very familiar with me with corrections. You know, we've, we've changed over the years, we've changed words to songs, you know, just because. The word maybe didn't in a song didn't line up with the scripture. You know, as Cole Stringer says, who cares if it lines up with the scriptures as long as it's a popular song? <laughs> he said that in jest. All right. Pray, be led by the Spirit, and then and only then do what the Holy Spirit tells you to do. So I'm done. But I just want you to know, first of all, I love you. And I'm not looking, I'm not walking around with a clipboard trying to find somebody in the church that's teaching something wrong. No. 
we all have, there's some things that are, are subjective. You know, there is the truth, but sometimes there's two or three different ways of looking at that truth. And sometimes they're all right, and maybe sometimes they're all wrong, or sometimes they're a mixture. But, but in these last days, just make yourself aware that there is the, the truth in the Word of God, and everything that you get taught, whether it be by me or whoever, check it out with the Word. Check it out with the Word. And if somebody comes up to you and say, oh, they just flew into church, <laughs> then all you need to do is you say, well, let's just go outside and I want to see you fly away. <laughs> You'll fly away, oh glory, you fly away. It's how you can test the spirits. You know, prophecies come to pass. And they come to pass if they're true prophecies. Did you know in, in Israel there was not a single false prophet? That's because every time somebody was a false prophet, they killed them. So that kind of weeds out the... <laughs> The prophetic words, you know. <laughs> I'm going to give a prophetic word if it doesn't come to pass, you know. Okay. You guys still love me? Come on. All right. It's really good. We're up to 30% now. <laughs> now, you, now, I'm not going to confess that. You all love me, right? Let it be known by something. <laughs> all right. Phil, you were so drunk while ago. I want you to kind of sober up and come up here. You're going to close us with prayer. How's that? You know, we were at a convention one time, and I was needing Phil for something. I said, anybody see Phil? Where, where did Phil go? I was needing him to go get something for me. And somebody said, well, he's over there. He's either asleep fell into the Holy Spirit, or he's dead. One of those three. <laughs> it was actually, he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That, he, um, was in his that was it. Pastor yeah. Mark and Terry Pierce's church. yeah. Okay. Um, a short <laughs> closing prayer. Bless him, Father God. No. Okay, no. <laughs> no. In the beginning, God created the heavens. We're just going to quote the Bible here. Hey, why don't you, don't I know you don't, calling. yeah, you don't have, yeah, you, you don't have to do that. Do you have to, do you need to get that? Yeah, Can you do it? Yeah. You're a part of the church, come on. You're going to do it one time without it. Okay. I'm still taking my shoes off. Cause You're going to take your shoes off? Because it's holy. Is it safe? I need my towel. Okay, I'll hold this for you. Okay. Now, this is a rendition of the priestly blessing. Now, let's, let's just clarify something here. This is the word, number six, chapters 20. Okay, I'll hide the microphone. I'm doing the talking right now. Okay. <laughs> Phil loves me. Okay, good. So, but, but at any rate, uh, we are not Jews. Phil was born a Jew. All right? Genetically, he was born a Jew. His traditions are Jewish. At one time, he was under the curse of the law. All right? Mm -hmm. So when we have him do things like this, and this is why I'm having you do it without the prayer show, mm -hmm. is, is because this is his tradition. We learn from it. We, we gain understanding of God's chosen people from it. But spiritually... He is no longer a Jew. And I was just reading this a couple days ago. It got so clear. It says, you know, we are no longer. You know, Paul said this about himself. He said, we are no longer Jew nor Gentile, but we're one in Christ Jesus. In Yeshua. And so, but when sometimes people will say, well, why does Phil do all that Jewish stuff? Or why does Loretta study Hebrew? Or It's because they're God's chosen people. We love them. Uh, God has a specific plan for them through the ages. A better plan is to be a part of the church. Okay, so um, 
I just want to let everyone know, because from time to time, when, when you do, you know, the Shema, from time to time, Part of a key uh, yeah. I'll have somebody contact me and say, do you have to be a Jew to go to your church? Or they'll say, uh, do I become Jewish when I get saved? Or they'll say, what if I don't know how to do that prayer? Does God still hear me? Oh, I get all kinds of stuff like that. So I just, I just want you to do that, but do it as the church. Okay. okay? Well, this is Numbers chapter 6, verses 20 through 23. And God's putting his blessing on you. So if Yeshua, Jesus is your Lord, receive the blessing from him because he's blessing you individually. Amen? Amen. <laughs> Yes, I don't know. Veshem lecha shalom. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you, and the Lord make his face to shine upon you, and he's so gracious unto you. The Lord. Lift up his face toward you, and the Lord give you shalom. Shalom.